Let me thank you all for coming. Um, I am excited to kick us off. My name is Phil Goldfeder. I'm the CEO of the American FinTech Council. The American FinTech Council is, is not your traditional trade association, but is an association built around uh, transparency, best practice across all FinTech verticals. Uh, I'm excited to announce uh, the first in our, our webinar series called The Future of Finance. Um, and of course, kicking it off with the best and the brightest as we talk and explore the concept around bank FinTech partnerships. I want to thank all of our members for their consistent support, but more importantly, I want to thank everybody who's here and, and participants in, in FinTech who believe that uh, creating regulatory guardrails and opportunities to increase access to credit without um, compromising on consumer protection or regulatory compliance is, is critical. And so I urge you to join the conversation, whether it's on the webinar or part of our, our, our many other activities that we have going on. Uh, I urge you to get involved and, and feel free to go to our website at uh, fintechcouncil.org to learn more about who we are and, and what we do. And so with that, I'm going to do a very quick introduction of our panelists. Um, uh, we have uh, Mark Franson, who is a partner at, at Chapman, Chapman & Cutler. Um, he'll tell you a bit more about himself in a moment, but he literally wrote the book on uh, marketplace lending. And if you haven't heard, I promise you he's going to tell you all about it, and, uh, and, and you're going to learn a lot. Uh, Mark, uh, Frank Borchert, who is the CAO and Chief Legal Officer at Best A, uh, a leading marketplace lending platform creating critical access to service. Uh, Tara Ryder is the head of government affairs at Cross River Bank. Cross River, one of the leading fintech uh, partner banks across the country, um, creating access to credit to families in need where traditional uh, services are no longer exist. Uh, Chris Peterson, last and, and obviously most certainly not least, um, is a professor at, and, and dare I even try to say your endowment and your professorship, but a professor at um, the University of Utah um, and a former candidate for governor I love, I love to talk about, as you know. Um, and so thank you all for joining us. Uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of information and knowledge um, that you're about to get. And so folks strap in for what I hope will be a, a really, really exciting conversation. So with that, Mark, as the guy who literally wrote the book, as I've mentioned, um, great friend, I really appreciate you being here. Why don't you kick us off and kind of uh, lay the foundation in terms of what we're talking about. The title, right, will the will the real true lender uh, please stand up? For those of you who don't get that reference, I'm not sure if you belong here, um, but uh, Mark, do me a favor, kind of lay the groundwork, let us know what we're talking about and, and what the current uh, state of play is. Great, Thank, thanks, Phil. Um, going back a ways, uh, most lending was local uh, until the widespread use of credit cards back in the 1970s. Uh, where national banks then exported their interest rates and fees across state lines. And in the late 1970s, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that federal law, in fact, preempts conflicting and more restrictive state laws, and national banks could export their rates and, and fees nationwide. State banks had no similar rule, but in a period of high interest rates uh, in the early 80s, Congress passed a law giving them the same right of preemption and exportation, with the caveat that states could opt out of that particular law. And while some six states did, in fact, do that, most opted back in, except Iowa and Puerto Rico, and until a few weeks ago when Colorado seeks to do the same next year. But non-banks had no similar exportation powers as banks did, and so they had to hear to local state laws with respect to licensing, usury, and rate restrictions, and prohibited uh, really a uniform national program. Inner technology, innovation, and fintechs uh, that created this marketplace lending industry, combining the bank's ability to export rates and fees with themselves as being service providers to those institutions to generate service and sometimes even buy those particular loans or interest in those loans. Uh, proponents of this structure tout this innovation as providing new products, uh, access to credit for those who couldn't get loans at banks, and increased competition. While opponents criticize this model as a sham, a rent-a-charter, uh, and that the fintech service provider is trying to evade state laws, including licensing and usury that otherwise might be applicable. Really, challenges have manifested themselves in, in four ways that we see. The assignment of loans, true lender litigation, 
enactment of state laws targeting these true lender issues and increased regulatory scrutiny. Many of you I know are familiar with the 2015 Madden decision out of the Second Circuit in New York, which ruled that a debt collector that bought a loan from a bank couldn't charge the same rates and fees as the bank could charge. That created quite a stir uh, among lenders and in the secondary market. And in fact, many avoided loans and studies uh, subsequently showed that there was a decreased access to credit. This was uh, remedied in 2020 when both the FDIC and the OCC issued their valid when made regulations codifying that the rates charged on a loan that is valid when it's made continues even when the loan is sold, transferred, or assigned. So as a result, the focus on whether a loan has been validly made and litigation has shifted to these true lender theories, namely that the fintech who markets services and oftentimes buys the loan is the true lender rather than the financial institution. The two sort of theories that are pervasive in this litigation are one, which is a total facts and circumstances test, and the other theory is that the entity that is the true lender should be the one who holds the predominant economic interest uh, in those particular loans. Uh, both of those theories are vague and don't really have definitive standards and are evolving. Uh, as many know, the OCC proposed a true lender rule a year or two ago that simply stated that the lender named on the loan documents and which funds the loans was the true lender, but Congress uh, negated uh, that particular rule. Many lawsuits have been brought on this true lender theory. Many of them have been dismissed because of the use of uh, individual arbitration clauses in the loan agreements, which have both minimized class potential, uh, dismissed those suits, and resulted in individual settlements. Uh, this litigation continues, but is not dispositive. And of particular note, uh, the industry is watching a high rate lender out in California, which is suing the state regulator there seeking a declaratory judgment that the bank sponsor model is in fact valid, which has implications not only for high rate lenders, but for all uh, marketplace lending programs. And then states have began to step into this scheme. Uh, Illinois, for example, in 2021 enacted not only a rate cap of 36%, uh, that while excluding banks was very, very broad in its application to bank service providers and to anyone who held that predominant economic interest in the loan. Although the law doesn't define what predominant economic interest is, and it also contains a very broad anti-evasion provision seeking to deter conduct that would circumvent statute. Penalties are quite harsh, including monetary penalties and uh, voiding of, of the particular loan. Again, subsequent studies have shown that the rate cap has decreased access to credit uh, in the state, but nonetheless, other states have followed uh, this particular example, capping rates, in some instances, seeking uh, licensing for some of these service providers, Maine, Hawaii, New Mexico, for examples. And just in the most recent legislative session, Minnesota and Connecticut passed laws uh, in this particular arena. So state action seems to be a continuing trend and is certain to affect uh, investor appetite in these particular loans. Finally, the true lender has been an increasing focus of uh, bank regulators. Uh, many of you remember that the Colorado Attorney General action against two online lending programs that was mired in procedure for actually years uh, before a settlement uh, ensued, but allowed those particular lenders to uh, continue operations in the state and ending up to a 30 cap. Um, that outcome may actually be outdone, uh, undone by the recent Colorado legislative action of opting out of uh, federal preemption if it's deemed to be valid, which would reduce rates to 21% uh, percent and, and again, potentially impact credit access. There's concern, of course, that that opt-out fever might catch on into other states, uh, but that action in Colorado really is subject to some uh, legal uncertainty since a prior appellate court there ruled that the FIREA law had actually revoked the opt-out right. 
And so there's a question of whether the state really had the ability to opt out uh, or not at this particular point in time. And the additional question of whether federal law or state law uh, is going to govern this uh, particular um, opt out right. So uh, again, the uh, uh, state may be involved in some litigation uh, on the horizon here unless uh, a compromise can be reached given that this opt out would not come into effect until July 1st of next year. But the winds are blowing in the direction of enhanced uh, and stricter regulatory supervision of bank fintech programs uh, and examination of, of banks. Uh, in fact, in April, the FDIC issued a consent order against a bank in this space. And while related to fair lending uh, issues imposed certain impacts and conditions on those programs with uh, fintechs, including uh, the need to obtain FDIC approval for any new programs. And most recently, just a few days ago on July or June 6, the federal banking regulators issued new interagency guidance on risks associated with third party relationships, emphasizing that a risk based approach to these relationships is envisioned, reiterating past guidance on the need to uh, have oversight during all parts of the third party relationship and indicating that regulators are gonna be more closely watching and supervising these third party uh, programs with FinTechs. So Phil, that's a lot by way of uh, background and current events, but uh, with that uh, rosy perspective and, and, uh, and information, I'll uh, send it back to you. Good, so that, like, that was a perfect table set and I appreciate that very, very much. And, and obviously any one of those points would take up an entire 45 minutes of debate and conversation. Frank, I mean, I'm gonna to go to you, right? Best Egg is, is a leading platform um, who's known for creating that access to credit uh, in a responsible way. Everything that Mark said obviously has an impact on you, right? As, as the legal, as the chief legal officer, you know, there's obviously your, your goal is to make sure that you're following the regulatory compliance and, and you're ensuring consumer protection, but that's a lot, right? What Mark says must be a full-time job you know, for, for dozens of people, how do you guys manage it at the, at the company's perspective from the lender's perspective? Hey, uh, uh, thanks. Thanks for that question, uh, Phil. And uh, I'm really glad actually that uh, you had Mark give the lead in because it's uh, so complex and lengthy that um, uh, it, it was almost daunting to me and I've been living through it for a while. So uh, I, I'd say a, a couple things. First, uh, Probably the thing not to forget is that we uh, and many fintechs like us, some some of whom are uh, associated with AFC, are looking to bring responsible credit products to consumers across the country. We're looking to increase competition. We're looking to give them choice, and uh, and doing so in ways that, for example, many large banks, the credit card industry, for example, is is fairly oligopolistic at this point. They're, they're not going to uh, be incented to do that, uh, to bring those uh, that choice. In some places, uh, digitally, we're able to uh, bring products to consumers when they otherwise wouldn't have them at all. They wouldn't have access to products. So uh, I think what we're, you know, with that as background, I would say, of course, we, we want to look at the laws of each state and to the extent that they apply, try to uh, to comply with those laws. It's uh, you know the the different state actions are making it more challenging. Uh, I think uh, we and uh, some other fintechs that partner with with banks are not necessarily in all fifty states uh, because some states. Uh, have such a restrictive regime that to comply with it would require um, more potential business than uh, you know than we than we see in that state. Uh, in in other states, uh, we will you know modify the program. Uh, there may be minimum loan requirements or maximum loan requirements that we uh, you know put put into the program. But it it definitely has uh, impacted our ability to uh, serve all customers across the country in an equal manner. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's disappointing because it's the consumers that are potentially 
uh, the, the, the losers. Thank you for that. And I'm going to encourage anybody who's on, uh, there's, a, there's a Q and A, uh, there's a box, feel free to use it. Um, I'd hope to, to get to some questions that we get from the audience. So feel free to use the Q and A box that's all the way down there. Okay, um, and Chris, I'm going to get to you next because I, I think that you're going to bring a, a, a keen insight here. But, but Tara, you work for Cross River, right? You're, you're at the bank, right? And, and I think there is obviously a recognition that as an FDIC insured, you know, a state chartered FDIC insured, regulated entity, you're taking or burdening that responsibility for regulatory compliance. And so how do you look at, at what happened at sort of everything that Mark talked about? Because I, I don't want to put it just on Colorado, even though that's probably top of mind for a lot of us. How do you look at this ecosystem and and, and, and what the future holds? Right. Um, so as Frank said, we really focus on the responsible banking, responsible partnership structure. Um, so as the bank, we ensure that all of our partners have, um, you know, they're complying with marketing uh, regs and, and statutes um, that the bank itself really is, is taking care of all of the credit terms, the origination services, marketing content for the entire lending program. So in addition, you know, we're also making sure that consumer protection laws are followed. Um, in New Jersey, the regulatory structure is robust and we you know follow everything in New Jersey to a T and we carry that forward. So we make sure that all of our fintechs are in compliance with not only our standards here in New Jersey, but all of the standards and all of all of the states that we're doing business in. Um, you know, another area talking about predominant economic interest and totality of circumstances are, you know, Cross River and many of the AFC members we make sure that we have a skin in the game. So on every loan that we originate, we maintain a portion of that loan on our balance sheet. That way, if there's a default or any questions, the consumer can go to both the FinTech and Cross River for answers on how that loan is structured or if they have any questions, complaints, or need uh, anything serviced. Um, so those are really you know, the main pieces that we look at when we're working with partners, onboarding a partner is, are they able to comply and how can we support them to comply? So again, I appreciate your commentary and, and let me just sort of add that not all FinTech is created equal, right? There's good programs and there's bad programs. There's good bank FinTech partnerships and, and those who don't obviously operate within the, the, the guidelines of, of sort of established law. Chris, you know, I'd love to get your take on this. Obviously you have been monitoring, you and I have been talking about these issues for, I don't know, seven or eight years already. Um, probably having some of the same conversations today, sadly, that we had seven or eight years ago, still trying to figure out what the answer is. You know, what's your take here? I mean, how do you look at this ecosystem, this industry? Is there a way to sort of bifurcate those who are doing it right or creating the access? Or is it just simply too complicated, like to, to what to everything that Frank, uh, excuse me, that Mark laid out, right? Is it simply just too complicated at this stage? Well, well, first off, Bill, thanks very much for having me, and it's fun to join join uh, such a you know uh, uh, prestigious, thoughtful panel. Um, I, I don't think it's too complicated. It is complicated. Um, I think Mark did a great job of laying out the history of all this. I, I would add a, a, you know a couple of episodes of history that you're going to leave something out, but 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 for my purposes. You know, during the 2000 aughts, when uh, a lot of both national and state chartered banks teamed up with payday loan companies, that's when the term rent a bank, came, that's what that, where that came from, because consumer advocates and academics were upset because they saw uh, you know, the exploding payday lending industry that, that in, this, in this context meeting, short term deferred presentment of a check or, or a, an ACH item. Uh, with repeated iterative loans that get you know, strung out 10, 15 times with effective interest rates of about 400% typically, but often surprisingly online, more expensive in online lending uh, as, as internet lending took off. And, and, it, and it, were, it was a handful of, of banks that were facilitating what, you know, not just consumer advocates and a lot of academics, but a super majority of Americans and both uh, the Republican and the Democratic Party in both red and blue states view as a, as predatory loans, and, and eventually, you know, the the OCC and the FDIC eventually cracked down on that. That was the, the period in time in which the Military Lending Act, which I worked on a bit, uh, uh, when, when Congress passed that, 
And, you know, one of the most formidable uh, proponents of that, of course, was the United States military, the Marine Corps and the navies, the admirals and the generals who saw their service members falling into problematic debt situations with these high cost loans. And, and that to me speaks to what the point that you were making just a moment ago, Phil, about, well, you know, there's some responsible products and there's some not responsible products. And to my way of thinking, look, you know, it's very difficult to distinguish between those two things. The most effective tool that, that we have come up with for drawing a line between them is generally speaking a usury limit. Sometimes an ability to pay standard can do that, but they tend to be very complicated uh, and it's easy to poke holes in them. And it takes a lot of um, uh, underwriting efforts to sort of make those uh, ability to pay standards functionally work. Whereas a, you know, an all in interest rate cap draws a pretty, pretty firm line. And that's and I think that 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 you know that, that insight is is what's driving the the new push in Colorado and maybe soon to be other states to opt out of um, uh, do do the the, the Demka opt out strategy that Iowa has had for so long uh, because there are a bunch of state a bunch of state chartered banks that are uh, once again making triple digit interest rate loans across state lines in ways that are completely unacceptable to consumer advocates. So whatever we do going forward, um, it's not going to be politically stable uh, uh, until you know those the loans that that a supermajority of Americans disapprove of are no longer a, a part of the lending ecosystem. So uh, Chris, I'm going to stay with you because you you invoke Colorado, and I want to talk about Colorado, right? Because that's a perfect example, and and the American FinTech Council is happy to work with uh, the Attorney General um, to sort of on the bill and to sort of delay implementation so we could further study and look at what the implications are. And so how do you find that balance, right? Exactly to the question we talked about before, I think, and we're gonna go to Tara right after your answer. So get ready, we're gonna go to Tara. I mean, Tara is gonna, is gonna talk about sort of the access to credit that's gonna be limited if we if we opt out of Dimica. And so how do you find that balance? And, and sort of what does the attorney general do, right? And let's put yourself in for a moment in the attorney general's shoes where there is rural minority communities who don't have access to credit and yet we're going to stifle kind of some of the innovation. Yeah, so don't have access to credit. But again, the, the point is, that's the point of uh, reestablishing the primacy of Colorado's usury laws to stop access to credit that there's a good chance is coming from across the border in my home state of Utah, uh, some of which is very objectionable to the people of Colorado and to the Colorado legislature. And I guess your, your concern is, well, maybe there's gonna be some responsible credit that's thrown out with the, the, the irresponsible credit. That's a, that's a tough call. But the, the, thing, the thing though, is that you know, if you ask the average Coloradan who, who who do you want to decide what's responsible or not? And they're probably going to say, well, we'd like, we already decided. We, we, we passed a usury law, a, you know, a scheme of that in the state legislature in Colorado. I, I do suspect that there's probably some conversations to be had. And I'm, I'm way out on over my skis here. Uh, uh, these are both skiing states. Um, the, the, the way out over my skis, I suspect that there's probably a conversation to be had about, about you know, where if, if there's some tinkering that needs to be done with the Colorado uh, licensure and usury scheme. Uh, and I suspect that there are some reasonable people in Colorado that would be willing to have that conversation. But but are they going to want to draw the line the exact same place that that, uh, you know, a lot of the fintech banks uh, that, that are, you know, pushing the boundary, you know, maybe really large, uh, you know, $50,000, 34% interest rate loans that you, you may not be able to agree about that. That's part of what a healthy, vibrant democracy is supposed to be all about, though. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And, and that's part of what we're going to hopefully do with the attorney general and, and groups in the ground in Colorado. All right, Tara, go to it. It's all yours. I mean, I, I know you've been thinking about this, you know, sort of all consuming for the last bunch of months. I mean, I mean, what's your take? Right. So, you know, in, in Colorado in, in 2020, we touched on the settlement that was reached there that Cross River was a party to, um, where Although we're capped at 30% in New Jersey, the settlement covered loans up to 36%. And there you know, are stringent requirements that all parties have to adhere to. And that settlement is, is used now to go after these high interest lenders, not the loans that are under 36, but the loans that are above 36. So you know, when we're talking with the attorney general and we're, we're analyzing our data and who's gonna be impacted by this, is the bank? Of course, the bank's gonna be impacted. We can't make as many loans. However, our data is showing that 
upwards of 150,000 Coloradans who are our current customers right now, come July 1, they would not be able to get the same loan that they have now in a year. So, you know, they're they're going to lose access to credit. And part of being a responsible bank and partnering with responsible fintechs is taking a look at somebody's ability to repay. So if someone does not have the ability to repay their loan, they will not be granted a loan from a responsible actor. So, you know, the argument of should they have that access to credit, you know, that should be on, you know, multiple factors, their ability to repay, their income, their credit history, their credit score, their job status. So there's all these different factors that are taken into consideration when originating a loan, um, you know, and we fully support, you know, 36 and below, having skin in the game. So we're really hopeful that this summer, as Phil said, we'll be able to get to a really good place in Colorado. The attorney general has been great to work with as is the legislature. Um, so, you know, we're, we're worried about the Coloradans who will be cut off from that responsible credit that's slightly higher than their usury. And, you know, they'll have to go to the outside entities that are still going to, you know, break the laws, the unscrupulous, the pawn shops, the entities that were written out of the law that were originally in the law. And then there's also the credit card piece where you can have a 36% uh, APR on a credit card compounding daily at $25,000 and no one bats an eye at that, but you know, a 27% say um, $7,000 loan is, is now illegal in the state. So that's really, you know, our hope is to try to find that common ground with them this summer. Thank you. Chris, you talked a bit about kind of what Colorado did in 2018 with their referendum on payday lending. You know, Tara, you talked about the settlement. Frank, you were a part of the settlement, right? Uh, I know that it was Avant and Best Egg um, who were sort of a party where the initial sort of targets of that settlement. And I say, I, I, I'm, I'm able to say targets and initial targets because ultimately you worked with the attorney general to walk through what the program looked like to what the standards you had in place. Talk a little bit about kind of what the settlement was and what your thoughts that in terms of how that could lean and lead other states to take uh, uh, to take the lead uh, or to take that example. Uh, sure. I mean, you know, I, I guess uh, Mark will tell me if I'm uh, now talking about uh, dead history, but but the you know, the principal objective that we had and I believe we shared with the um, with the AG uh, in settling was to create a structure that would both address allowing us to work with bank partners, again, to deliver responsible credit to Coloradans and leave uh, the AG and his staff with the right tools to address the concerns about high rate lenders that uh, Chris eloquently uh, described. And uh, I, you know, it, it took a lot of effort to craft that because of, lo and, and lots of considerations including the, you know, the risk, even as we were settling uh, of the OCC true lender rule, which did subsequently come out. And we, had, we, we addressed that possibility in the, in the settlement. Uh, and I think, I believe that many of us, certainly I did think that this could provide a roadmap for creating longer term clarity across, uh, across the states. And I, uh, you know, one of the challenges is that for folks who are trying to reach compromises, that uh, there are plenty of folks, and this is not unique to this issue, maybe in our American political system these days, but there are folks on uh, both sides of the issue who say, no, you know, lenders and consumers should, uh, you know, be able to contract the way they want to. And other folks who say no, um, states should have complete control of all lending and it shouldn't be a nationwide market. So I, I, I think we have many, many forces. In fact, that's, I know Isaac asked a, a question uh, in the Q&A. We'll get to that next. And, and I, I wish I could be more optimistic on this. That certainly is an area that I would love to see clarity in, but, uh, but there are so many countervailing forces at work that uh, it's, it's hard to be optimistic of a of sensible compromise. Maybe Chris may be more optimistic than I am. <laughs> and, and Phil, um, so, uh, just just to, yeah, to sort of chime, chime in, re remember that, you know, an opt out isn't uh, a total solution to this problem because it only applies to state banks, national banks, 
are not affected by this at all. So you can have a national bank and make loans at, at you know any price uh, if if it's allowed in their in the state where they're where they're located. Um, and, and there's also a question because the law also applies to you know where the loan is made. And we again have this federal state conflict, if you will, because under federal law, a loan is made where some three non-ministerial functions are performed, the granting of the credit, the dispersing of the funds. Whereas under Colorado law, their statute essentially says any loan by any means to a Colorado resident is a loan made in Colorado. So there's a direct conflict between where the loan is made at the federal level and at the state level, and the opt-out only applies to loans made in the state. So there's yet another um, challenge, I guess, for the attorney general there to deal with. Um, Isaac completely broke the rules because he sent me an email and he put a, a question in the chat box. He's trying to get me in, in every possible way, but I, I think we covered a lot of the Colorado conversation. I mean, I, I guess I'll ask this to any one of you who want to say, is there a, a dream of we'll actually get firm clarity on Valwood made and true lender, or is it is it not possible, right? Can we actually ever get the clarity, I think, that will enable sort of the banks, the fintech companies, and, and Chris, the consumer groups to kind of all sit around a, a, a table or a campfire and sing Kumbaya. I mean, can we get there? I, I mean, um, you put both together. I mean, just I'll throw it out there, Mark, you can, you can opine on this. Uh, I, I feel that the banking agencies settled the valid one made is, issue by and large. So, but true lender, no. I, and I'm not, like I said before, I'm not optimistic in the near term. <laughs> and, and Phil, I guess I, I would add that, you know, it seems to me that maybe we're a little bit backwards on, on the true lender issue. A lot of the focus seems to be on this predominant economic interest. And marketplace loans like mortgage loans, credit card loans, auto loans, most of these are sold into the secondary market. And so the people who really have the true economic interest have nothing to do with generating you know, these particular loans. And I think it would be pretty ridiculous to hold the banks, the funds, and the note holders and securitizations to be true lenders. Uh, and responsible uh, for those those kinds of, of, of things. So I, I really think it's sort of a misguided principle and and I don't think court decisions, you know, which will be fragmented or fractionalized at best are, are the answer either. But but to me, I think part of this uh, goes to to really sort of the banking regulators. And, and you know, we talk about good products, bad products, good programs, bad programs. And it seems to me that the emphasis is not so much should be on the fintech, but on the banks that, you know, what are they doing uh, as Tara says, do they have skin in the game? Do they have oversight? And I think that's what the third party guidance that came out a week or so ago is, is trying to address uh, as well. And, and if we get more clarity from that side of the equation, uh, I think a lot of the predatory things will go away and, and we'll be left with the more responsible program. Yeah, um, I, I want to take a stab at Isaac's question too. I mean, I, I you know, I, I was uh, in a very small way part of the the, the Avant Best Egg uh, settlement in Colorado too. I was an expert witness in that case um, for the for the Colorado Attorney General's office, and you know, the, I mean, the settlement was a was a. I think that a lot of consumer advocates saw that as a bit of a, a relatively weak settlement. Maybe some folks in the industry liked it better. But the the problem with with having something like that is that it it, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily become a pattern that everybody buys into because lots and lots of people didn't feel like their voices were heard or their interests were were represented in, in the formation of that of that compromise. Um, uh, and 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 I think that that's part of the, the underlying structural problem in in getting to the the certainty that that Mr. Potansky was asking about. Um, I, I, I think, but but that being said, I, I am I think somewhat more optimistic, but and uh, uh, than than Frank is. But it's because I still believe that maybe someday, uh, against all hope, Congress will actually um, or against all. All um, you know, reasonable uh, uh, per perceptions of past behavior. I still have some some sense that perhaps Congress will someday come out of its 
malaise and and uh, thug uh, to 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 realize that there is there is the grounds for a fundamental compromise. I suspect that if 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 there was a deal on the table to everybody um, that's making loans, or is affiliated with somebody making loans in this room, where they're not going to make any more loans that are above, let's just say, the Military Lending Act all in APR cap, and in exchange for that commitment you get some of the certainty that you want about um, you know, the true lender doctrine. You already got some about valid when made, but it's going to be a precarious valid when made certainty because the political tides may change. Uh, if that valid when made doctrine starts to be used in particularly predatory ways, uh, yeah, no, there's no certainty that you're going to get to keep that. Um, a, a fundamental compromise would be for us to agree on a national consumer protection, consumer friendly usury limit. It's not, it's not as aggressive as what other consumer advocates would want uh, and is probably a little too aggressive than what some of the banks and fintech partners want. Uh, but in exchange for that, you get some, some measure of certainty across the complicated federalist system with all these different states. That is a fundamental thing that I think a lot of us could agree on. The folks that won't agree on it would be some of the banks that are uh, uh, niche banks that are charging well beyond that 36% cap, uh, the pawn shops and payday lenders that have extraordinarily high interest rates, and maybe some of the bigger banks, but the truth is most of them don't really push beyond the boundaries of the Military Lending Act anyway. They just are sort of philosophically against it. If you are, that's part of why I'm interested in, in working with the FinTech Council, because you really are a pivotal spot in the national debate about this that could perhaps eventually champion the compromise that, um, or, or champion the certainty in exchange for a, co a compromise of meaningful consumer protection across the land that Mr. Boltanski was talking about. No, I. I can't thank you enough for those comments. Obviously, you know, the American FinTech Council uh, previously supported 36%. I mean, obviously, we support 36% rate caps, but there have been bills in Congress um, initiated and, and introduced, and, and we've been known to support it. Mark, Chris, you both talked about certainty. I mean, it, we, and, and, and Mark, you talked actually about um, the unified uh, third-party guidance that came out last week from the regulators. Um, Tyra, I think this sort of most sort of took to banks. Um, and so we'll go to you in terms of, is that maybe a little bit of the clarity we've been looking for? I mean, for so many uh, folks in the fintech world and in the bank world, particularly, we've been talking to, we've been pointing to Phil 50 for a long, long time. Um, we've been waiting for this guidance. The American Fintech Comment, uh, Council commented on uh, this in, in October of 21. We're now in June of 23. Is this what we've been waiting for? Is it everything you expected it to be? And do you think it actually solves any problem? Um, so it's definitely a step in the right direction. It's, it's something we've been hoping for and waiting for and submitted comment on. And, um, you know, it, it gives the bank a lot of clarity. It gives our partners clarity of, of who's responsible for what, um, and how these, uh, programs should be, uh, laid out. Um, I think, you know, in some ways, I think it pr could probably go a little bit further, Phil, as, as you said in your, in your comments, um, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. It really gives the bank more clarity of their oversight and what which programs the oversight uh, lies within. All right, Frank, you're you're the next question. I mean, obviously, from the bank perspective, it's a step in the right direction. From the tech company, do you feel a little? Is it, do you, do you sleep a little easier at night knowing there are a little bit more sort of guardrails or at least some clarity on some of those guardrails? Um, I mean, I, I, I'd say. Uh, from my perspective, maybe there uh, is a little bit, this is a step forward from uh, where the guidance, the status of the guidance has been previously. Uh, I am actually worried about maybe a different challenge, which is because it's principles based, uh, that's meant to give flexibility, which is, which is usually a positive in guidance, but it, it could mean that you end up with a lot of regional differences based on individual um, supervisors and exam teams uh, that may then have one fintech uh, bank relationship being managed one way or and and uh, you know and, and you'll get just variants depending on the region that you're in so uh, you know I, I think it's a positive i i think it's probably just the first step of maybe even additional uh, guidance as you know as we learn more and as you know uh 
uh, and Chris was alluding to, sometimes bad facts make for, for bad law or bad guidance. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully the, the regulators in Washington, one notable aspect of this was they didn't, you know, they came together on this guidance. This is not the FDIC issuing its guidance and the OCC issuing its guidance. They came together and worked together on this guidance. So that, that is a positive. Um, and maybe the other elephant in the room is, you know, the big tech companies, and I mean, Google, et cetera, are all, you know, getting into the payment and in some ways the lending spaces. And so how, I think some, some of what the regulators do going forward is going to be driven by uh, how they regulate those companies or how they worry about those companies and the risks that are going to be so. um, Mark, I'll go straight to you. Obviously, you represent a number of fintech companies. You represent a number of banks specifically around these issues. Is the guidance helpful to you in terms of your actual pragmatic day-to-day -in -day and the way in which you make certain arguments or defense, you know, sort of, or speak or represent some of your clients? Yeah, I, I'd agree. It's, it's a step in the right direction. Um, regulatory guidance usually isn't as specific as the parties want it to be. Um, and, and so, you know, as Frank says, there's going to be some room for interpretation and it could go one way or it could go the other way. Um, and there is, is the risk that it's, it's not going to be um, administered in, in the same way. But it is it is better than what we had. It's it is a step in the right direction, and and I think more importantly, it's it's um, uh, a calling card uh, to say you know this is on our radar screen. We we are going to be scrutinizing and supervising and examining these third party relationships, and 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 that I think is is something all of us uh, you know would would see as as a positive to to get to the ends the the that we're all talking about here today. I think Clarity and, and Tara, I'll talk to you because I know you spend a lot of time in various states. I mean, most recently in Colorado and, and the American FinTech Council follows obviously a number of state legislatures as they enact different laws. I mean, third party guidance from the federal government is great as long as there is a recognition from state governments and state regulators that it exists, right? That the concept that, that all FinTech you know, is unregulated and it's the wild west is simply not the case. I mean. Talk about, is this maybe helpful now for at least to go to state regulators, to state attorney, state's attorneys general, to argue the case that the fintechs are regulated via the, via the bank? Right. So, you know, I have probably talked to almost every regulator in all 50 states at this point. And if there's anyone on this call that I missed, I will give you a call, shoot me an email. Um, they are constantly in touch with their federal counterparts, right? So when, you know, the OCC or the FDIC puts out guidance, they're reading it, they're taking a look at it. Um, you know, and from my conversations with the regulators and even the legislators, they don't feel that fintech is is truly the wild, wild west. They know that the the responsible actors like Cross River, um, we're, we're regulated. We're regulated by our state regulator. We're regulated by the FDIC. So, you know, they're going to take this guidance and, and take a look at their own regulations and see what do we need to update, what laws need to be amended to reflect what this guidance is saying so that when entities are operating in their state, they're able to operate under both federal and state law. So, you know, it's while it's on industry to make sure they're following all of the guidelines and the regulations, you know, the states also have to take a look to make sure that their regulations are not conflating and confusing for industry so that everyone can operate safely and ultimately provide the consumers with the best products that are available. Excellent. There's, there's one question I'd like to maybe, this is actually maybe a, a good place to land and, and give you all a chance to weigh in. Um, can you give some examples, and Tara, you touched on this a little earlier, can you give some examples how a good bank and a bad bank, and again, I don't know, you know, how do you consider a quote unquote bad bank, would structure its vast program um, related to true lender, um, specifically where loans are originated? So maybe Mark, sort of how do you see that? Like, you know, how would somebody implement uh, their program to sort of make that differentiation? Well, you're right, there's another 45 minute uh, segment right there, but um, the, the bank has to be involved. It has to be hands-on and from start to finish. 
uh, and, and it has to be a true approval process, uh, not not some uh, something that's you know made up or not looked at. It's it, you know it means cost of compliance. Uh, it means cost of of oversight uh, in virtually you know every particular arena because the bank is going to be held responsible for those programs. The third party guidance you know indicates that you know that that certainly is 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 going to be the case. So it has to be from from start to finish throughout that whole life cycle. Frank, obviously you've been doing this for a long time. I mean, this is something that you guys and Investec has believed in in terms of, of ensuring that sort of regulatory compliance and, and sort of the highest um, level of compliance. I mean, is that the only way to do it? And is that the right way to do it? Uh, I mean, it's it may not be the only way to do it, certainly. Um, although I I think, you know, we, we try uh, to do a number of things. One of the ways that we happen to structure our particular program uh, to the extent possible, and and I think I think Tara alluded to this earlier, is focusing on making sure all parties have skin in the game, uh, and uh, are you know involved in the process. But we run, you know, we we look to run our compliance as though we were a bank, and so that when we send things to the bank, all marketing copy and sending. Uh, you know, making sure that uh, the credit policies match up with the bank, uh, that, that we're thinking about that compliance from, from the bank's perspective. Uh, because uh, to Mark's point, the bank, it, the bank is the lender and the bank owns the process and the bank will be uh, criticized by its regulators if there are flaws in the process. So we're a service provider to the bank. Um, Chris, you're going to get the last word here, um, and, and I very much appreciate it, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in, but again, I, number one, I share your optimism, right? I think, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. It's the reason I, you know, I'm, I'm at the American FinTech Council, because I'm hoping to, to, to try to really initiate real change, but, you know, again, is there a way to, to sort of work with consumer groups so that everybody understands that, that there is a process and that while we all agree that it needs maybe amending or shifting or adjusting, that we can actually get to a place, you, you know, is there a, any tips you can give to sort of the tech companies, the, the, the fintech companies and or the banks in terms of how do they, number one, engage, but number two, build out their, their, their processes and systems? Well, there's a lot in that question. It's a great question. Um, I, I think in terms of like engaging with the consumer groups, it, it's, it's a complicated ecosystem. And sometimes the consumer groups are in competition with each other in surprising ways. You know, and, and, the, and different consumer groups have different goals based on where, where they're at. You know, I, I mean, uh, in a state where there's no effective usury limit and, and there's rampant, really high interest very abusive payday lending and, and similar kinds of longer duration installment loans. I mean, the, the kind of compromises that, that the consumer advocates would be happy to entertain are going to be much more aggressive than in a state like New York, where they have, you know, some quite aggressive usury limits and a very robust enforcement uh, uh, environment, both with the attorney general's office and the, um, uh, the financial services regulatory off, uh, outfit. Uh, so you're going to get different voices in the consumer rights movement, and I think you have to bear that in mind. Uh, uh, and and I think if if there's ever anything that's going to happen in Congress, they're going to have to coalesce around something, and there's going to have to be compromise not just across industry and, and consumer groups, but amongst consumer groups. That's going to be something that's going to be, I think, a big part of the challenge. As far as structuring the loans, I mean, I, I do... You know, I think there are going to be other folks on the call are probably a little bit more thoughtful about that than I am right now. I am a little suspicious of, you know, whether or not there may be background warehouse lines of credit uh, or, or other ways that, um, you know, the, the, the non-bank partner is functionally taking on virtually all the economic risk that, that could be subject to, I think, some litigation risk. But for me, you know, a lot of oftentimes my biggest concerns are, are, are not even, you know, necessarily most of the bank partnerships, but are, but are still the same kind of you still within the orbit of, of fintech. I mean, they call themselves fintech companies, but they're non-depository lenders that are still operating out of um, uh, off of Indian uh, reservations or sometimes offshore companies that have extraordinarily high oppressive interest rates. Um, and I think I, I would have 
encourage the industry to bear in mind that that's part of why states are clinging to their state control, because they don't trust that they have a reliable federal partner to protect them from some of the more predatory products that are out there in the marketplace. So that was great. And that was a perfect way to end. I want to thank each of you. I mean, this was I mean, a, a complicated subject matter uh, and topic, and, and you all kind of broke it down really well um, through the guidance last week and, and what happened in Colorado. And so I appreciate it very, very much. Obviously, this is not the first conversation we've had on this, and I can assure you it won't be the last. I want to appreciate you all for being here and for joining us as our first as we kick off the first of uh, our, our newly initiated webinar series, The Future of Finance uh, by the American FinTech Council. So thank you everybody for joining us and uh, we'll see you at the next one.